Oh, thank you, my man. Oh, good morning, good morning. How we doing? Okay, all right, amen, six of you. I'll wait until later, I'm not scared. You don't scare me. Well, welcome, welcome. Let me just start by saying welcome to those that are watching online, our online community. We love you so much, those that are in the chapel. Can we show them some room love? Just show them. So grateful for you. God is doing some incredible things in our online community under the leadership of none other than Evan Conley. How much, he, if you don't know Evan Conley, you need to get to know Evan Conley. He is, uh, I call him the resident nerd of Lighthouse, but because he knows all things IT, AI, and online, we love him so much. And uh, he loves you guys, and he loves our online community. And so we're grateful for you. If you're joining with us for the very first time, I just want to say welcome. We love you. I know that sounds really weird, but we do love you. Why? Because we got Jesus in our heart, and he gives us a great love, and we love to get to know you. So if you're joining with us for the first time, you can get all information about Lighthouse, whether or not we're weirdos and all that jazz. That's communicated by our Welcome Center out there. And by way of beginning, I got an announcement, and this is a big one, all right, because this is the commencement of something. And that is, is that if you came in through the front of the building, even in the back, you probably saw a major display in our foyer. Mm -hmm. I'm growing in my vocabulary. In our foyer, also known as the hall, also known as the foyer. Out there is where we have 1,000 backpacks. This is our initiative, amen? Mm, Okay, okay. Amen, let's get excited. These backpacks are utilized to gather school supplies so that we provide those down in Honduras the ability to have all the supplies needed to go to school. This is a big deal. And I know, I know I'm asking a lot because if you're anything like me, you're starting to gather school supplies for your kids and it's costing about a billion dollars. I totally get it. But these school supplies are absolutely unobtainable if they weren't provided for the students down in Honduras. And so here's what I wanna ask you to do. We got 1,000 of them. You can grab a backpack. You can fill it, little list, little, 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 all enclosed, let you know what they need, how to fill it, what not to get, what to get, and you can return it. We need them back by August the 30th. Come on, somebody. And so you got, you got a couple weeks to do it. It is a blessing more than you could ever imagine for these students to have these backpacks. I want to fill every single one of them. 1,000, you can grab them. Even if you don't sponsor a kid in uh, Honduras, you can still grab a backpack. Amen? Amen? So here's the deal. Grab one. Um, Don't be stingy. Come on. Come on. You can go to Walmart, and you you, you can do it all for about seven bucks. Amen? (laughs) Seven bucks. That's what it's going to cost you. Grab something, we're gonna send it down there, we're gonna have a good time doing it, amen? We're blessed to be a blessing, amen? And so with that, I'm gonna pray, we're gonna jump right in, we got some ground to cover today, okay? We are in the second installment of a series Johnny Blaze launched us into last week entitled Hear From God, and I'm excited to preach to you, amen? I'm excited to hear it. So just because I'm speaking, it doesn't mean I don't hear it. I'm excited to hear myself, all right? (laughs) Why? Because I'm I'm just going to share a lot of scripture with you. Not what I have to say, what the Bible has to say. So get excited. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we love you. Lord Jesus, we are so thankful that you are a God that draws near to your people, that you're a God that stirs our hearts. Father, you satisfy our souls. You come and meet us specifically and individually. You know us inside and out, Father. You know us better than anyone. You know us better than we know ourselves. And Lord Jesus, I pray by the work of your Holy Spirit, you would come, you would meet us this morning, you'd change us, you'd shape us, you'd draw us close to Jesus so that when we leave here today, Father, it wasn't just another morning in church, but Father, we'll have a a, a more emphatic desire to draw close to you and to shine you to a dark and dying world. Do just that, Father. I know it would be a miracle, but you are a miracle work in God. And we thank you and we pray this in the matchless name of Jesus and all God's people said, amen. amen. 
I have been very outspoken um, about uh, my story of how I met Jesus. My salvation story was, um, uh, by my estimate, it was very dramatic. Um, uh, many of you know I met Jesus in a rehabilitation center 20 plus years ago. I was a strung out heroin addict. I was raised in a gospel centered home. I watched the model marriage. Uh, it, there wasn't an issue therein that caused me to go wayward. I sort of lived up to the stereotypical PK in many regards where I just run and gunned and did my own thing and wound up out of a fear of dying, I wound up in this program. It was the only thing that led me to that program. That cr program was very Christ-centered. It was a Christian program called Teen Challenge wherein I found myself. Um, that program would prove to be 13 months long. It was the single most instrumental shaping of my life to present day. Uh, what happened in there, I don't have nearly enough time to tell you about. However, two weeks into that program is where I met Jesus. And I met Jesus through, as said, dramatic fashion. He came while I lie in a bed on a Friday night, hot. I remember that night, it was, there was no AC in the house, hot and God came and spoke to me. And he spoke to me when I wasn't even looking for him. All I wanted to do was get clean, get well, and then get back at it. I wasn't looking for Jesus, I wasn't praying, I wasn't rending the heavens, anything like that. Nevertheless, the God of heaven came and spoke to Paul Samuel Foster. This is what he said. Sammy, you find out how awesome I am and you'll fear me. And when you fear me, you'll obey me. And when you obey me, you'll fall in love with me. I remember I heard it the first time and I thought, that's, that's, that's really weird. That was really weird. And I thought, could that have just been the terrible pasta that I had just eaten? <laughs> or could it be that I haven't fully detoxed yet? What, what caused that? And I remember I just sat there thinking that very thought, that was weird. And then I heard it again. Sammy, you find out how awesome I am and you'll fear me. And when you fear me, you'll obey me. And when you obey me, you'll fall in love with me. Understand this, that when I heard that that night, I didn't have the depth, the character, or even the wherewithal to understand what that even meant. I knew that it came in a succession of, of, of statements, but I didn't know how they worked in correlation with one another. I didn't understand where that was found in Scripture. I didn't understand what I was to do. All I knew, all I knew is that without a shadow of a doubt, that was God. People have since asked me, was it audible? No, no, it was definitely internal, but I heard it and I couldn't hear anything else. I swung my legs off the bed in which I was lying in and I heard it over and over and over again. I had a little salt and pepper composition notebook and I just started writing in it, the same thing. Sam, you find out how awesome I am and you'll fear me. And when you fear me, you'll obey me. And when you obey me, you'll fall in love with me. What transpired after that account were two miracles, two miracles that led me to believe that was legit. Now, I, I knew it was legit when it happened. I, I don't care. You couldn't have talked me out of it. You couldn't have argued. You couldn't have, I, it, it didn't matter to me. I knew that the God of heaven came, found me right where I was on Clovis Avenue, pierced through the roof of that home into my stony, hard, arrogant heart and spoke to me. But then what happened was the real indication uh, that something miraculous just transpired. Because I remember sitting there and I was crying. I was so blown away. I mean, I was shook. And I remember thinking, and I said, God, save me. Just save me. And in that moment, something transpired. Two things. One, one, one you're not going to think that big of a deal of. I did. Second, you might not think that big of a deal of. I did. The first was, is that all of a sudden, I noticed the following morning, every time that I would go to curse, I would get a check. Now, I cursed a lot. I mean, every other sentence was littered with about four F-bombs. I mean, that's how I made my point. Right? That's how I, 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 I th those were my exclamation points. And it seemed like I was exclamating a lot. I mean, I, all of a sudden, every time I would say, whether it was the, the, the bad, bad one, the F-bomb, or, or even a subtle one, I would feel like, oh, I, I, I can't say that. Nobody told me, you got to watch your mouth. 
clean up your mouth. I'm gonna wash your mouth out with a bar of soap. Nobody told me any of that. All of a sudden, just organically, I knew I gotta watch the way that I talk. Now, truth be told, that was sort of a big deal because my vocabulary consisted of about six words, four of which I couldn't use anymore. <laughs> so I was left with the and a. I was like, this ain't gonna work for me. I gotta read a book or something. I mean, all of a sudden, I didn't know how to even make my point. And so I was, I was real self-conscious and I didn't like grieving the spirit within me. And I just felt like I got to clean my language up. Second, second, which was incredible, is all of a sudden, I had this insatiable desire to read God's word. I mean, I couldn't put it down. I couldn't, every, every, every moment that I had spare that I wasn't in, character refinement class or doing a work order or filling some obligation, I was in God's word. And I was like devouring it. Now, mind you, I, I was raised in a Christian home. I had heard the gospel, lion share in my life. I was taught, I sat, my father was a pastor. I would listen to the word constantly. You know, our, our, my, my father, my mother, they read the word daily. And yet it seemed like every time I read it, it was afresh to me. Like every time, like the words would just jump off the page. I couldn't get enough of it. I had, you know, like a green, a pink, and a, and a, and a yellow highlighter. I was highlighting everything. I would highlight an entire page. One guy one time said to me, you, you don't highlight the whole page. That sort of like defeats the purpose. You highlight the distinct parts that jump out at you. I said, they're all distinct. They're all distinct. I mean, my Bible looked like a coloring book. I was just highlighting and highlighting. And so it was this one particular day, I said to this guy, as I was sitting in the little, in the little sofa area therein, and I said to him, I said, I don't know why I have such desire to read God's word. And without hesitation, he didn't even clutch. He said this, he went, oh, I'll tell you why because God has an even greater desire to speak to you. I just remember I, I, I heard that and I was infatuated with scripture up to that point. That point shifted something in me of where I've never read the scripture the same again. I've read it now as if God intently, purposely, eternally, and divinely wrote a message for Paul Samuel Foster. So when I read God's word, I'm not reading it to preach to you. I'm reading it to read me. I wanna hear what God would say to me and what God would show me and what God would reveal to me about himself. When we talk about scripture, last week John talked about hearing from God through the living word, Jesus, Yeshua, the Messiah. This week I wanna talk about the written word. When it comes to scripture, obviously, if you've been around church for any length of time or you've never been around church, you know that the church that's worth its salt, not, not just because they got church on their logo out in front of their building, a church worth, worth its salt upholds and elevates the sacred scriptures. They believe that the scriptures provide life, that provide revelation, that's God's authoritative inerrant word. When it comes to scripture, we're talking about a compilation of books, 66 in total, written over the course of 1,600 years by 40 plus different authors in three different languages, in 12 different nations, in three separate continents, all put together communicating the same message. These people didn't even know one another. They didn't know one another, yet by God's inspiration through his Holy Spirit, through the pens of men, these people would write down what God revealed to them, coalesce them all together, wherein we have what is called the Holy Bible. God's revelation to mankind, all pointing in the same direction to the same thing. If you're wondering, for the reductionist purposes, I'm gonna tell you what it's all about. It's all about Jesus. So, so, so let me just speak to those that, 
have, have carried this disposition towards scripture as if it's this obligatory book that you gotta read in order to follow Jesus. Oh, my sweet friend, that couldn't be further from the truth. It is a book that we get to read that reveals to us Jesus. It's not a have to, it's a get to. And so when it comes to the weight of this scripture, I wanna read you two, just as a jump off, just to show you just what, what it is. The first I wanna read to you is from the Apostle Peter. He wrote in the first chapter, 23rd verse, and this is what he said. For you and me have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable. Meaning that seed that God planted in you, it can't die. It's imperishable. Through the living and enduring word of God. What that means is, is scripture's going to say that the word of God, Hebrews 4, is living and active. There's, it, like it has a pulse to it. Divides soul and spirit, cuts to the even motives and intents of the heart. It, it's powerful. It's power packed. He says this, for all people are like grass and all their glory is like the flowers of the field. The grass withers and the flowers fall, but the word of the Lord endures, what's the word? Forever, forever. This is what he says. And this, Peter said, is the word that was preached to you. Okay, now I wanna read you a second one. Here we go. This is from James chapter 1, 21. He says, therefore, get rid of all moral filth and the evil that is so prevalent and humbly accept the word planted in you, which can save you. Do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. Anyone who listens to the word but does not do what it says, like someone who looks at his face in the mirror and after looking at, at himself goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like. But whoever looks intently into the perfect law, the word, that gives freedom, I, I love that, I love that. This idea that, that, that the word just wants to lock you up. It just wants to bind you. It wants to cramp your style. It wants to limit you. Oh, no, 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 no. It brings freedom and liberation. Why? Because outside the word, we're already locked up. If you're anything like me, we get ourselves locked up, jammed up, backed into a corner, held captive, yoked, and bound all the time. You don't even have to try. We just do it. This is why scripture calls us sheep, because we're dumb. <laughs> Welcome to Lighthouse Church. Hope you feel out of five. <laughs> Here we go. Watch this. Whoever looks intently into the perfect law that, that gives freedom and continues in it, not a one and done, continues in it, not forgetting what they have heard, but doing it, watch this, they will be blessed in what they do. Okay, so what Peter said and what James said are two things that you need to understand about Scripture. Number one, first is, is that Peter said, Scripture is timeless. Meaning it's not like relevant in one era, obsolete in another. Oh, like, like, like it was good back in, you know, AD, you know, 900, but now, you know, eh, not so much. Why? Because we've been enlightened, babe. You know, bro, I mean, we sort of see things more broader scope now. We get it, and you know, and back then we didn't, but now we've understood more things and we don't really need scripture. Hear me, hear me. Scripture is eternally relevant. Everything, everything, as James says, or Peter says, everything is decaying. Everything is dying. Everything is eroding. Everything is come, go. But he says, but the word of the Lord endures forever. Heaven and earth may pass away, but the word of God will stand. It is so prevalent. I, I know this is my first time living in 2023. This is, my, this, is my, this is my first rodeo of this era. Hear me on this. The scriptures are so relevant for now. 
Everybody else's alternative relevancy is trash. Yeah, I said it. It's a joke. It's a joke. Our worldview, our what we should do, the legislation, cultural trends, pop culture, try this, try that. We look like a circus. But the word of the Lord endures forever. It is timeless. But secondly, secondly, then James says, it's a mirror. And let me just tell you this. It's the perfect mirror meaning it's gonna really show you the real you. Like, I, I, I have certain mirrors that I really like. Come on. If you, if you get right down to it, I was thinking about it. The, the, the mirror that I like most, Mom, I'm gonna tell you right now, is in um, the handicapped dressing room at Marshall's, all right? Mm-hmm. I know, I shouldn't use it, but I only use it when nobody else is obviously in there. But I don't know what it is about that mirror, but I mean, that mirror makes me feel real good about myself. I don't know if it's the lights that sort of line the outside of it or it's the dim lit room that it's in, but every time I'm in there, I'm like, man, I really look good. I think I'm doing the dang thing, right? Every shirt looks dapper. I mean, I'm like, yeah, I'm gonna rock that. I'm gonna da-. And then I take it home <laughs> and I get it in the bedroom and Ruth's like, what the heck? Why did you think? I was like, it was that mirror. It was that mirror. It lies to me. It's a lion mirror. Anyway, anyway, the scriptures will not lie to you. The scriptures are true to you. The the scriptures are the clearest revelation of you. And they show you you so that you can see you in contrast to him. And then do what he says to walk in. The scriptures are the clearest revelation of us. It understands our motives. It understands our whys. It understands our intents. You can't run from it. The only reason at times I don't wanna read scripture is because I don't wanna deal with me. Sometimes I don't wanna wanna see another chink in my armor. I don't wanna see another flaw. I don't wanna see another area to work on because I'm racked and stacked to the gills. Nevertheless, nevertheless, it shows me the real me and then it shows me the grace of the Father that covers all of it. So one, it's timeless and two, it's the truest mirror you will ever look into. But when it comes to scripture, it is the foremost way that God, the infinite creator, majestic one that rules over all and sees all and understands all, it is the foremost way that he speaks to us. I get really, really scared when I talk to believers that say God speaks to them a lot but have no daily habit in the scripture. Mm, That's a making for a weirdo. True story. I've been around the church a long time. That is the making for some really strange stuff. And if you haven't met one of those people, you just hang in there, little partner, you will. (laughs) Somebody that believes they hear from God all the time, but gives no regard to the holy text. So when it comes to what God really wants to speak to us, I wanna just give you a few of the most significant things that God speaks to us and what about. The first is, the first is, if you're wondering, what is it that God speaks to us through Scripture? The first is you need to understand the Bible is our model and our standard for living. If you're wondering, and we should, we should, if you're wondering because you've come to the end of you, how do we do this thing called life? where you sort of grow fatigued with everybody's sort of TikTok, Instagram, motivational speech, daily habits. I'm not discounting them. Some of them are really good. But if you're tired of waking up at 5 a.m. and getting an hour and a half in at the gym and making sure your T's are crossed and eating all organic and you're trying to sort of outgrind, out hustle, out work and be the best version of you and you're feeling like there's something lacking, it's because you haven't gone to the chief model and standard of how to do life. God loves us 
so much, individually and specifically, that he's provided us the model, the picture, and the standard for how to live. I wanna read you this. Peter, one, again, says this. This is a dense text, but hang with me. Listen to this. Peter writes, concerning this salvation, this new walk with Jesus, that our lives are surrendered, the Holy Spirit is filled, we're now walking with Jesus. He says this, the prophets, Old Testament, here we go, who spoke of the grace that was to come to you, searched intently and with the greatest care. Meaning, God would speak to the prophets of old, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Habakkuk, Micah, um, 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 uh, on and on and on, uh, minor majors, on and on and on, as to prophesying as to the model and the standard of life. He says, they searched intently in the great, with the greatest care, trying to figure out the time and circumstances to which the spirit of Christ in them, God was working on them as he inspired the Holy Scriptures through them. The spirit of Christ in them was pointing when he predicted the sufferings of the Messiah, Jesus, and the glories that would follow. Meaning that God was speaking through the prophets and the writers of the Old Testament about the forthcoming Yeshua that was coming, sent from heaven, so as to bring grace and redemption and salvation to mankind. It says that they searched intently, trying to figure out when all this would go down. Watch this. It says, it says, it was revealed to them that they were not serving themselves, but you. Peter writes, this was for us. They didn't even understand it when God was speaking to them because it wasn't really for them, it was for us. Watch this. When they spoke of the things that have now been told to you by those who have preached the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven, even angels long to look into these things. Okay, what did that just say? It just said that God orchestrated and architected from the beginning of time that he would speak through men to write the divine scriptures for future generations, even before Jesus showed up, to give them a picture of how all things would unfold. And then what grace would look like, what salvation would look like, what life with him should look like, even the angels looked in into the mystery of how is all of this supposed to be? They didn't even get it. They didn't even get it. Check this out. But now we get it. Now we get the model of life. We get the understanding that Jesus is the Messiah. We get the truth from lie. We get straight paths from crooked ones. We understand that grace and the spirit of God now dwells in us to walk with him so that we ultimately walk uprightly, free, not held captive, glorifying God. The prophets of old only understood in part what we now understand clearly. It's the model of how you and I do this thing called life. This is why the psalmist says that the word is a lamp for my feet and a light on my path. Like it illuminates, oh, this is what I should do here. And it illuminates about every facet of life. This is how I should treat my wife. And this is how I should raise my kids. And this is how I should steward my finances. And this is how I should live a life worthy. And this is how I should carry my testimony. And this is what I should do. And this is what I should stay away from. This is how I radiate Jesus. This is how I live pure and clean. This is how I sleep well at night, not all jammed up. This is how I keep my hands pure. It tells us all of that so that we become vessels that glorify our maker. Meaning, meaning, you don't have to figure this out on your own. Why? Because we can't. We can't. It'd be like this. Check this out. Okay, all right. 
this little Lego set right here, okay, a little creator, this braid up. I, I, I personally really like the whole family situation going on here, all right? This looks a little bit like the American dream, all right? I mean, beautiful little home they got there, okay? And he's happy, son's happy, she's happy, got a little dog over here. Okay, they're doing the dang thing. He's done well for himself. I appreciate that. And so this is the picture for many of us, truth be told, in the realest sense, this is the picture we're after. We're after the, the unfortunately, it's been labeled the American dream. I don't know if, if that's even reality any longer. However, but a life filled with joy and clarity and perspective and right worldview, understanding, surrendered, on and on and on. This is what the the scriptures say that God has called us to step into, not without suffering, hardship, trials, tribulations, but by and large, a blessed life. This is why James says, those that do the word and continue in it, they will be blessed in all they do. Imagine if I was to take this little, this, this little jam right here, right? And I was to go, okay, hey, hey, hey. Yeah, I want that. I want that. That looks really good. Okay. Oh, here's all the manuals for how to do it. Okay, yeah. Okay. Oh, this is how you build it. Okay, you know what? I don't need those. Okay, I'm just gonna, oh, okay. Oh, okay. Here's all the pieces, all the ingredients. to. Yeah, actually, I don't need that either. Hey, you know what? I'm just gonna start putting it all together. This is what we do. <laughs> Don't look now. This is what we do. And then you'll meet believers that are like, oh, you, pr- you probably want to refer back to the model. Nah, don't need that. I'm going to build it on my own. And then we build a train wreck in a dumpster fire. And we're like, I, I don't think this is coming together. <laughs> well, listen, Hot Rod, you don't have to figure it out on your own. There's a manual and a standard. So you know what we do nowadays? Nowadays, when we put it all together and we're like, oh, we don't like this. Oh no, I don't don't like this. Now we're in in in, in, in the vein of we're just altering definitions. We just change the language. You You feel me? This is why scripture said in the last days, people will call evil good and good evil. Why? Because we got to make some sense of the set or life because we've disregarded the model. So now we'll alter anything. Oh, kids, they don't need to respect authority. No, that's, that's antiquated. Uh-uh. They can cuss them out in the middle of the classroom right in elementary school. It doesn't matter. Hey, they're autonomous little human beings. We need to give them rights. Oh, okay. Okay, hot rod. That's going to work well for us. Hey, you don't like gender? Oh, we'll just swap that out. That doesn't even matter. What? (laughs) That's so old school. That's weird. Um, We'll alter anything to try to make sense. Why? Because we've disregarded the model and the standard that our loving creator provided for us. This is why we read scripture and we let it wash over us so we know truth from error. This is why, this is why this, Timothy, right? Paul wrote to Timothy, he said, and from now and how from infancy you've known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. All Scripture is God breathed and is useful for teaching and rebuking and correcting and training in righteousness. Righteousness is just a theological term for right living, blessed living, God's model and standard of living. Watch this. So that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. I don't want to read the Bible. (laughs) Then you don't want to live right. You don't want to be blessed. You don't want to hear from God. You don't want to be disagreed with. When it comes to Scripture, Scripture first is our model and our standard for living. But secondly, and I would argue, arguably most importantly, the Bible is the story of our hero. Like, I don't care if everything between the leather, 
I think even the maps point to Jesus. I, I, I think it all is a neon light to our Messiah, our Redeemer, our salvation, the living word, the written word, the logos, the wisdom, the life. I am the way, the truth, and the life, Jesus said. The Bible is a culmination that points to Jesus, aka what that also means is I'm not the hero. If I think I am, then all I am is a narcissist. I'm not the hero, I hate to break it to you, and neither are you. I don't care how gifted and charismatic and and awesome and athletic and on and on and on you are. We're not the heroes. There is but one who is and his name is Jesus and scripture collectively points to him. Why? Because God the Father thinks that's a really important detail. He wants the adoration of his son to be held in the highest supremacy. And so we have a book that points to him so that worship would ensue. So, 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 so check this out. Um, it was, we planted Lighthouse Church in 2010. Uh, the, the second, second, pop planted in 2000, took us to 2010. There was, there was arguably like a replant in 2010 where we moved from Pasadena, Maryland to Glen Burnie, Maryland. Okay, and, and that, that was a divine moment because if you move from Pasadena to Glen Burnie, you wanna make sure that's God. <laughs> Come on. But we collectively as an eldership, we knew it was God. And so we moved to Third Avenue right there off of Crane Highway. It was lights out from opening Sunday where God was just doing, he, I mean, the stage was set, the, the soil was fertile. We, I mean, it was, it was crazy. We were adding services like our job just to keep up with the, the need. And so I remember we planted, and one year later, one year after that plant, my wife got into a near fatal car accident. She was on New Cut Road, stood a Suburban up on its nose, rolled it six times. I had my six-month-old at the time in the back seat, along with my three-year-old daughter. Not a scratch on them, incredible. God's hand and his protection was all over that car. Ruth, however, got thrown from compartment to compartment, shattered her pelvis in six places, massive internal bleeding, collapsed lung, all kinds, all kinds of complications. And so it was, Jackie, you're, you're the one that called me and said, Ruth has been in a horrific accident on New Cut Road. You gotta get there as soon as possible. I was on Third Avenue. I drove to New Cut Road and the whole thing is still a blur, just how, how I got there. I pulled up, I saw the Suburban in the woods. Um, I saw the ambulances, fire trucks lining. And all of a sudden I could hear the medevac, the chopper coming in to land on an adjacent parking lot right near where Ruth had gotten into that accident. And I ran up because they were transporting her now from the ambulance to the parking lot to move her into that helicopter. And I, I stood there, it was um, Lieutenant Jackson. I said, can I please see my wife? He said, you cannot, there's no time for that. And I plead, I said, I gotta see her. So I jumped up into the back of that ambulance and I grabbed her hands and I said, babe, I'll meet you at the hospital, I'm praying. And Ruth couldn't even talk, the pain was, 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 was that much. And I would find out after the fact that the only reason that Lieutenant Jackson let me get in the back of that ambulance is because he thought that would be the last time that I ever saw Ruth. And so I was driving, my father drove me down 97. I saw, I saw the chopper go over our heads. And I got to shock trauma and where they took her. And I was, you would pace, oh my gosh. Remember, we would just wait in that waiting room and we'd just walk back and forth, back and forth. And every once in a while, the doctors would come out because you're sitting in there with a lot of people and you, uh, uh, there's a lot of people that know Shock Trump. They would come out that door and then occasionally they would ask the family to step into this adjacent room to the left. And in that room, you would hear women, uh, moms trying to catch their breath. You would hear skin curling screams because that was where they told them, I'm so sorry, it was a fatality. So I remember just standing, standing in front of that, 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 those doors just thinking, if he asked me to go into that, I, I don't know what I'm gonna do. 
Nevertheless, he, call, he, he walks out and he says, Mr. Foster, you can see your wife now. Where he brought me up onto what's called the true floor, the trauma resuscitation unit. And I get up onto that floor and there's Ruth. She's intubated, she's sedated. Um, and I, I just remember, I, I couldn't even think straight. And I pivoted to walk down this corridor and walking toward me were, were five, a team of five that were all wearing the pink suit. And tr- <laughs> truth be told, the lead dog, they were like in a V formation, the lead guy that was coming at me, I remember looking at him and, and as, as in shock as I was, I remember I looked at him and I thought, dang, that is a good looking dude. <laughs> I don't know why. I don't know why. I just thought, man, that, that cat looked like he just walked out of a magazine. I mean, he was yoked up, his hair was right, he was doing the dang thing. And, and he walked up to me and he said to me, Mr. Foster, and he told me his name, he said, I'm the chief surgeon that will be taking care of your wife. Here's what I need for you to do. I need for you to find, sign these six waivers. They were the six surgeries that Ruth would undergo, all with a 50% or better fatality rate. So for liability purposes, I had to sign all those papers. And he said this to me. He said, now, Mr. Foster, before you sign those, if you would like us to take your wife to any other location for alternative opinion or for other procedure or possibility, we will transport her right now, whether you desire to go to Hopkins or wherever that may be, but time is of the essence. And then he paused and he looked me dead in my runners and he said, But Mr. Foster, I would have you know, when it comes to the procedure that we're getting ready to perform, we're the ones that wrote the book. (laughs) Listen, there is arrogance and then there is confidence. In that moment, I I wanted to just hug him. I probably would have just kissed him right on his neck. One is confidence and two is looks. I would have just grabbed hold of them. Just, just, I want to be like you when I grow up. In, in that moment, I realized, why would I go to anyone else if you're the one that wrote the protocol? You're the authority on the matter. He, hear me, hear me. When it comes to this thing called life, I don't care about people's opinions. I don't care about modern era. I don't care about cultural trends. I don't care about a TikTok video or an Instagram post. I want to know the one that wrote the book. I want to know the one that wrote the book. If you didn't write it, then fall in line with the one who did. We are creation. He is the creator and he's provided us the story of how to do this thing called life and it's all about him. This is why scripture said the son of man, Jesus, is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation for in him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, All things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead. So that in everything, just, just, just a little slit in there. Oh, just, just in case you're not impressed yet. He came back from the dead. That's sort of, that's a, that's a, that's a pretty big credential. You want to hang on to that one. He's the first mourn among the dead so that in everything he might have the supremacy. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him and through him to reconcile to himself all things, us, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. Church, the written word is how God speaks to us about the model and standard of life and about our hero, 
Jesus. And lastly, I'll end with this. This isn't comprehensive. It's just a really big deal. But lastly, the Bible tells us how to be saved. Whether you acknowledge it or not, maybe some you're just kicking the tires of the faith and you're investigating and I say, God bless you. We're so honored that you're here. But I just wanna tell you something among all of us. We need a savior and we need salvation and we need to be saved. And the Bible tells us exactly how to be saved. It never gets old to me. It's not the elementary truths of the faith. Oh, it's the supreme truth of the faith that God went to great lengths to save us. Hear me on this. When it comes to being saved, it's not just talking. Scripture doesn't just talk about your eternal soul. It it shows us how to be saved from ourselves, how to be saved from anxiety, how to be saved from our own depression, how to be saved from bondage, how to be saved from our own foolish perspectives, how to be saved from, from, from broken marriages and broken parenting, how to be saved from terrible testimonies left, but now redeemed and renewed one's right. It tells us how to be saved from all the areas that we get bound to, but supremely it tells us how to be saved from the very wrath of God. Hear me, I I know it's not an easy thing to talk about, and in many churches, it's a non-issue to talk about, but let me tell you, when it comes to what we're saved from, we're saved by the blood of Jesus from the wrath of God that burns against his creation that does not bow their knee that one day Jesus the Messiah is coming back, Revelations 19, with all the armies of heaven to set the record straight once and for all, to come back for a holy, spotless, pure bride that's been saved by him, that will spend eternity with him, that he knows and pens your name in the Lamb's book of life. He saves us first from himself so that so that we live right and we walk humbly and not narcissistically this is why paul writes to the ephesians and says don't be foolish but understand what the lord's will is why because he's given it to us we would be fools to try to build our set without his model or standard. And so when it comes to you wondering, how do I get in right standing with my maker? Paul tells us, if you declare with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, this means that it's not just lip service but it's coming from the inside out. I believe with my heart that Jesus is Lord. Hear me, hear me. That's gonna manifest itself in a lifestyle. It's not just words, baby. It's walk. And it's gonna manifest itself in then saying, now I wanna know how his model and standard applies to my life. and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified, and it's with your mouth that you profess your faith and are saved. Hear me, church. God, he's so good. He's so good, and he's so loving. And he's given us every provision for life and abundance. It boils down to a choice that you and I have been freely given to make. Actually, before we conclude, Jess, I just feel that maybe there's those in and among you that you can't say, I'm saved. I'm saved. I know it. 
you, you, you got a doubt. You don't know if you've believed in your heart and confessed with your mouth. And so here's what I want to do. I know, I know, I know we're, you know, you knew I was preaching. You knew we were going to go long. <laughs> Here, here's what I want to do. I just want to give you the opportunity right now. God forbid. God forbid. Why? Because tomorrow's not guaranteed. And so we're not going to make a big to do. Hear me, hear me. If you sit here today, we're in this together. If you sit here today and you can say, I don't know, Sammy, but I want to know, I'm going to ask you to stand to your feet right now. I'm going to ask you to stand to your feet right now. Go ahead, be bold. Amen. 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 Stay standing. Amen. 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 Here's what I want you to do. I want you to stand up, stand up, stand up. We're all, we're all together. Everybody can stand up now. And hey, hey, if you were sitting there, your heart was beating out of your chest, and you're like, I, 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 I didn't want to stand up. Well, now, now, hey, take this. This is our gift to you. Here's what I want to do. I want you to pray this simple prayer because here's what I'm believing. Here's what I'm believing. This prayer doesn't save you. The confession of your heart's belief and the words from your lips that confess that belief are what save you. And so I want you to pray, Heavenly Father, let's pray together. Heavenly Father, I believe that Jesus is Lord. And I believe that God raised him from the dead. And I confess with my mouth and believe in my heart that Jesus is God. I surrender my life and my desire to do it on my terms. So now I live according to your model and your standard. Please forgive me of my sins and make my heart pure so I can live for you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. If you just prayed that prayer and it was for the very first time, I want to invite you to go out to our Welcome Center. We got a gift for you. We got a Bible. We got next steps. We'd love to walk alongside of you. This isn't a one and done. Your journey just got started. But just FYI, we're going to spend eternity in heaven together. Amen? Sort of a big deal. And if you need prayer at the end or want to follow up, there's going to be a response team down here. Let me pray for us in our going out. Jesus, we love you. Jesus, we thank you for your written word. We thank you for your revelation to us, Father. We thank you for your Holy Spirit within us. I thank you for my brothers and sisters that were grafted into your kingdom today, Lord. Why? From the belief of their heart and the confession of their mouth. Lord Jesus, bless them abundantly. Bless us abundantly, Father, as we make it our pattern to dive into your word and to do what it says for your glory and for our joy. In Jesus' name, amen. And we love you all. Have a great rest of your way. Amen. Well, thank you so much for joining us today. And hey, if you just prayed that prayer, if you made that decision to accept Jesus, to commit to following Jesus, in the same way in the room that we encouraged so many to come forward, to talk with us, to receive a gift, we want to do that for you online as well. And so right now, I want to encourage you to head over to lh.church slash sp, that is short for starting point. And we've collected so many different starting points as you've accepted Jesus and are walking out this new relationship with Jesus. Just different steps that you can take. We want to get your information. We want to get in touch with you. We want to send you a gift wherever you're watching from, if that's the case, some resources to get started in the faith. And at that same link, we even have live chat available with pastors and leaders to answer questions, to pray with you about this. 
And so again, lh.church slash SP. We want to support you. We want to walk alongside you. And we have a whole team. We have so many resources to do exactly that. As we close out right now, I just want to take a moment to pray over some of the requests that we've seen come in today, really all of the needs, all of the requests that would be present as we're coming together right now, as we're doing a church online with one another. And so specifically a few that I saw come in today that we certainly are including in our prayer. Mary shared a request for David who is battling cancer right now. And so we're certainly including David in our prayer here. Sharon mentioned she broke her leg and with that, she's been going through so many different difficulties when it comes to her health, when it comes to the mental and physical toll that this is taking on her. And so certainly including you in our prayer, Sharon. And Debbie, who's been through so much medically, um, continuing to recover, we certainly want to continue to pray for you, Debbie, as well. And so those are some of the needs to request that I know are present. I know there's certainly more, perhaps some I didn't get a chance to read off, even as you're watching on demand right now. Maybe there's something, it's not in the comments, it's not spoken, but we'd want to include that as well. Just I want to take a moment right now, invite you to pray with us over every need, every request that would be present as we come together here. Let's pray right now. Lord, we thank you for this chance to come together. And when it comes to these requests that I've read off, when it comes to so many more that I know are present right now, each and every one of these requests, Lord, we're giving them to you, we're seeking you, we're asking for your help with these things. And so when it comes to these different concerns for ourselves, for others around us, Lord, of health and healing, of medical issues, we're just giving these things to you and we're just asking, Lord, would you provide health and healing? Would you provide peace and comfort, wisdom for the doctors, the medical teams involved in care, but just in so many ways to help here in these concerns about health? In the same way, in so many areas of life right now where we need to make a decision, we don't know where to go, we don't know what to do, we just want to seek you, Lord, to seek you for your wisdom, for your direction, for your will for our lives. Help us, Lord, to walk out your will for our lives. When it comes to all that we're doing, Lord, just we want to fix our eyes on you. We want to look to you first and foremost. And as we do that, just live out our lives in a way that would make much of you, that would honor you, and that would glorify you, Lord. So in all of these different needs, in all these different areas of life, and all these different things that we're concerned about, that we're concerned about on behalf of others, we just present them before you right now, Lord, and we ask, would you help here in a way that only you can, that no one else could? And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. As always, thank you so much for joining us. It's been so good to come together, and we cannot wait to see you again soon.